Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. Special welcome to our visitors. We're grateful to have anyone with us. I know we're having boot camp right now for the youth, so if we have any youth who are visiting, we're glad to have you guys here with us, and we continue to pray. Uh, I've probably had maybe 10, 10 older people in the last maybe six months talk about boot camp to this day. Like it has changed lives, the destinies. It's just a beautiful thing. So keep praying for all these youth while they're gathered in uh, this week, laboring in the Word of God. So pray for them. A um, couple announcements I wanted to share with you that Lydia and Shannon, who are serving in Tijuana, are home with us. Are they here? I look at a crowd and I can't see anybody. Are they here? Oh, praise God. Welcome uh, home. Um, Lydia has a, a very severe mold allergy. I think both gals do. In, in Tijuana, there is a lot of, a lot, a lot of mold. And so Lydia has been battling some deep health issues and even uh, hearing loss that they're thinking could be associated with the mold, but her hearing's going uh, rather quickly and fatigue and brain fog. And so we're going to have her return home and begin um, helping her demold and um, just heal up. So I'm just asking that we could all help her in this season, help her transition as she comes back. And so a couple of things, uh, Epaphroditus, Paul said, let us, let us hold men like that in honor who risked his life for the gospel. Uh, and Lydia truly has risked her life for that planting of that church and laboring and to just hold in high regard a, a sister in Christ who has labored this way as well with Shannon. So one of the things I want us to try to do as she comes back is uh, a, a place to live, to, to help uh, focus and transition. So if anyone has a, a place that would work out, if you could see me and kind of let me know, I'm trying to help her uh, work through all this, why uh, her, her brain is like mine is all the time, I guess. I shouldn't send you to me, I should send you to her. <laughs> Um, I do have a lot of compassion for what she's going through. And so um, we'll, we'll be talking with supporters and how we continue to help her uh, in this transition and give you more time. But definitely be in prayer for her. There's a lot to work through and all that she's been through. And I just want us as a, as a body to, to love her and help nurture her uh, back to health in, in all ways. So... Let's come together as the body of Christ and help our dear sister in this time of need. So thank you, Lydia and Shannon, for all that you have done for the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the main things uh, that a, the church of God is to do is to gather and worship. So we gather to worship our God. This is a time where we just forget about ourselves and we, we have so much to praise him for, for who he is, what he's done, what he will do. And so I just gather and let's worship our God. And now we want to continue to worship him through the word of God as this is exposited and opened up. Worship your God and marvel. And I pray that we will do that now from this beautiful passage that we're going to be looking at. Just a reminder that, that these are the words of God that have been recorded for us in scripture. Do you realize the privilege, the creator of the universe has given you his mind? He's revealed truth and we hold it and we're going to open it up and unfold it and look at it. Don't take that for granted, please. The word of God we get to open up this morning. Sorry, I'm excited this morning. We are going to go back to the book of Romans. Thank you, Daniel, for that beautiful exposition of Psalm 46. Uh, flip back to Romans chapter 13, and in this powerful last section of that chapter, it, it just struck me hard uh, the last time that we were in it, and I pray that it would do the same this morning. So let me just read it, and we'll go to our God and ask that the, the truths would break into our minds and hearts and transform our lives. Verse 11, do this, knowing the time that it's already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ 
and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Let's go to our God and ask his blessing on these words. Father, I thank you that you have given us these words perfectly inspired by the Holy Spirit as Paul penned them and wrote them for us not moving away his humanness, his will, his, his thought processes, and, and you just superintended it to where what we hold this morning is the word of God. Let that bring reverence to every heart. Lord, let us now be awake. Let us be awake to the things of God. Let us be awake to you, your kingdom, your purposes, what you are doing in this world. God, wake us up. And I pray now, Lord, this, I believe, is the right message for the right people at the right time. And this morning, we need an exhortation. We need to, to have the scalpel cut flesh off our hearts. So Lord, this is going to hurt. And I pray that it would hurt unto the way of healing, unto the way of sanctifying us and making us more like Jesus Christ. And so I pray for these dear sheep, God, that this morning you would bless them in the word of God and you would do the perfect work in each heart. Let it be worship. Let them sit here before their God and let the word of God have its way. Let no one resist the word of God. God, move in power and do things beyond what we could hope or believe during this hour. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> well, our, this is part two. Last time we were together in Romans 13, uh, Paul tells us to wake up. He says, wake up and know what time it is. And you need to know that, that we're in these end days. We're, we're moving toward the return of Christ and the consummation of all things. You need to know that, that the time of darkness, the time of night is coming to an end. It, it's a, this whole season of the world and sin and all that we watch, it is coming to a close. And the, the light of the world, the glory of Christ is going to break in and take over, rule, reign, throw down all sin forever and bring in a new heaven, a new earth. We have an amazing finish for what's coming. And, and, and that should not put you to sleep. It shouldn't be, I'm just drowsy. I'm just meandering and coasting and, oh, gosh, you done yet? We, this should wake you up. This, get alert. Be sober. In light of this time, some major changes need to take place, Paul's going to tell us. I've been watching that movie, Remember the Titans. If you haven't seen it, I think you should. Coach Boone, he takes over this very mediocre football team and he says, guys, we are going to change the way we run. We're going to change the way we eat. We're going to change the way we block, the way we tackle, the way we win. Winning is about desire. And so Paul is coming in and saying, children of light, we're going to change the way we think, the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we love. We're coming out of darkness and we are going to be changed in all ways. We are different from this world of darkness. We have been brought into the light. We're going to change the way we live. We're going to put off that old life that we lived in darkness and in Adam, and we're going to put on the new man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on Christ, he'll call us at the end. Guys, we're going to change how we lived when we were in darkness. The gospel demands it, and the gospel will change us. We must change from when we did not know God and we lived for our lusts and our pleasures and lived in darkness. You can't see the light and say, I'm just going to keep living like I did when I was blind, dumb, and mute. Can't work. So put off and put on. Our first point was wake up, put off and put on. That's where we left off in verse 12. <clears throat> the verse 12 has a therefore. And now there's a, a connection the fact that the, the day is almost, uh, the night is almost over and the day is about to break in. You live on the eve of the re returning of Christ. And it's supposed to do something. Therefore, therefore, in light of all that I've been saying, Paul's saying, in light of the time that you live in, therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness. This word carries the idea of taking off clothes and putting them on. Change your clothes. You're done with the garments that you wore while a child of darkness. You're done with that. All I could picture was Lazarus and his grave clothes all wrapped up. And then he's come forth and he comes out and he's still wrapped in all those loincloths. And Christ says, unbind them. 
He's been raised from the dead. Unbind him, unloose him, set him free from his grave clothes. Take him off. And so he's saying here, you've been made alive. You were spiritually dead. Take off your grave clothes of the darkness and living in it. Take them off. Be done with that. We need to take off the night garments that we wore when we walked in darkness. And Paul says, what were they? <coughs> Carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity and sensuality and strife and jealousy. Take those things off. Be done with it. Carousing was, was the, the partiers, going around just good time Charlie's, partying, drinking to just drunkenness. I, I don't know what is wrong with our culture, but today in the church, they think drunkenness is not a sin. It's just applauded. It's my liberty. It's sin. And Paul is saying, come out. Come out from this world that has to numb itself daily and get rid of reality because we hate reality and we're so numb to it and broken. So let, let's numb ourselves up. And he's saying, come out from that world. Come out from sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Come out from a perverted, twisted, broken world. You live that way when you didn't know God. Don't keep living in it and, so, and, and make peace with the sin of pornography. I got, it just, everybody battles it. Do not make peace with the darkness and the clothes that we wore when we didn't know God. And so I, I am stepping on your toes because I love you. Wake up, take that off. That doesn't belong to children of the light. And we just make excuse after excuse after excuse to live in it. And Paul's saying, wake up. The time is almost over. Do you want Jesus to come back when you're sitting here doing all this? Get ready. Wake up. Jesus is coming. Be about him. Be about his kingdom. This is not the time to get drowsy and meander and just be dead, cold, apathetic people. That's what he's calling for. Put off strife and jealousies and struggling with what other people have and causing divisions and fighting and put those things off. Put them off. There's something so much better. That's what the world does. That's how they handle everything. Put it off. These things will not bring the smile of God, but God says it will bring his wrath. We've got to wake up. Nighttime living in darkness. Paul's saying, take off your pajamas. You're in the light. Put on the armor of light. Who would go to work in their pajamas? <laughs> hmm, that's funny. You don't go to work in your pajamas. <laughs> and Paul says, put off the deeds of darkness. And in, in earlier in chapter 6, he says, those are the things that you're now ashamed of. Because lights come in, and you look at how you used to live, and, and you're ashamed. I'm ashamed that I thought and lived and acted that way. I'm ashamed. Romans 6, 21, he says, what benefit were you deriving? He says, but death. All that was doing, all that was going to bring about was death. But you have been transferred out from the kingdom of darkness into his marvelous light. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9, you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. You're a people for God's own possession. Why? So you can proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. You get to go shine and publish the power of God in his gospel that you came out of all that darkness. You, you've, you've come out. Go, go be a billboard for Jesus Christ as a mighty saving God. He delivered you to his marvelous light for you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. That's just been Romans 12.1. You've received mercy. You're the people of God. You're, you're done with being an enemy and a hater of God and alienated from him. You've been transferred out of that into this marvelous light of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Let us be done with the behavior that we had when we did not know God and we lived for our lusts and our desires. God broke into our darkness. And he said, let there be light. And he, he brought light into our minds and gave us a new heart that loves him. He's shown there's darkness all around us. And in the gospel, he broke in and, and light has broken in so I can think and I know what matters and I get Jesus and I get his kingdom. I just think in a whole new way. And so I, I can't live like when I was just crazy to God and an enemy. When we lived according to this system, you've been in darkness, Paul says, but now we're in the light. Proverbs 4, 16, for they cannot sleep unless they do evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. <coughs> they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of righteousness is like the light of dawn. It shines brighter and brighter until the full day. And the way of the wicked is like darkness. They don't know over what they stumble. They're just tripping and stumbling and they can't see why. But we have light. So my son, give attention to my words and incline your ears to my sayings. And what I want to do is get your Bibles loose or your phones. And I just want, to, I just want you to let the Word of God just speak to your hearts this morning. So I want you to turn first to John chapter 3. <clears throat> May the Holy Spirit reveal these truths to our hearts as we read them and wake us up thinking that we can live in darkness and it doesn't matter. I want to fight you on that till I die. I want to fight you to not believe that that's okay to live that way. And I just, I love you. And I refuse to just smile and let you go into that. John 3.19. This is the judgment. But the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light. For their, their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. And he won't come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Just little cockroaches hiding from the light of God. But he who practices the truth comes to the light, Jesus, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. If you will flip over to Ephesians chapter 5. <coughs> I think Paul says this really clear in this section. I'm going to start in verse 3. We're doing good on time. Verse 3. But immorality or any impurity sounds like Romans 13 or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints, called out ones, saved ones. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk, which is just a day in America, or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks because you can't get over this gospel. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who's an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God is going to come upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, like Romans 12.1, trying to learn the will of God. What is it that pleases him? Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them, for it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in the secret and at night. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I hope that you're seeing what Paul's after. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5.
I want you to begin with me in verse 1. Now as to the times and the epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. And here it is. Know the time that you're living in. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child. And they're not going to escape. That's the time. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that they would overtake you like a thief. It's not going to surprise you because you're urging and hastening the return of Jesus. You're looking for it. You're loving it. It's not going to catch you off guard. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do. Don't be sleepy. But let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night in the darkness and all their evil deeds, they go in the dark. But since we are of the day, <laughs> let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. I want you to remember those three things, to put on a breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for the obtaining of salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's our hope. He died for us so that whether we're awake or asleep, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. Write down in your notes 1 John 1, 5 through 7, and he talks about the darkness and light in 1 John 2, 7 through 11, but what I want you to see very clearly is the common thread in Scripture is you're not in darkness anymore. You've been brought into his marvelous light, and you can't keep living like you were in the darkness. And he, he wants you to get that. Oh, church of God, I pray as one of your pastors, deep love is that you wake up and you don't think that this kind of life in garment of darkness is the acceptable sacrifice to God that we've been looking at since Romans 12.1. I want it to break in and just say, that's not acceptable. I, I have made peace with it. Oh God, change my heart right now. Wake me up. Wake me up. You know what the smelling salts are? Jesus Christ. And I see and I wake up, and that's where he's going to say, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my prayer for my heart and for yours. The sun's breaking forth. I can see it all over, and he has on our hearts. What time is it? It's time to take off the garments of the night and put on the armor of light. So what is the armor of light? This is an interesting to me. I, expect, I expected Paul to say, put on your night garments, don't you? Take off your pajamas. And put on your, your night clothes, your morning clothes. Uh, put on your day garments. Put on the robe of righteousness. But he says, put on the armor of light. Pajamas to armor. Sleeping in your jammies to wake up. You are now in a fight. You are in a fight for the kingdom of light. It was not just wake up, but wake up and enter into war. You are to fight the good fight of faith. You have entered into a battle against the darkness. All this darkness now is going to hate you because you're light and you think like God and you look like God, you act like, they're going to hate you. And so it's going to wake up a battle and enter into this war is what he's saying. Too many think the battle is over when you're justified. I'm justified and now I'm just sitting on a slow train to glory with no battles, no fights. I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. And so justification makes you alive to this battle. It gives you life to want to fight against the deeds of the darkness and sin and what we see all around us. Has your justification rocked you to sleep in your battle against sin? That ought not to be. You've been justified. We spent a year on that. You've been enlisted to the greatest battle that there is, the battle for righteousness, the battle to offer up your bodies a living sacrifice to God that is pleasing. 
That's the battle. I am now on a battleship. Coach Boone, I knew I shouldn't have watched that movie. (laughs) When you put that uniform on, that Titan uniform, you better come to work. The armor of light, put it on. Verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so my question is, what is this? What does that mean? How do I, how do I put this on? And I thought I, 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 I thought I already put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been preaching that for years. And so let me try to help sort all this out. And I think 1 Thessalonians will do it. I'm just going to read you. Don't turn to it. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 7 through 8 for your notes. <clears throat> he says, for those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. I asked you to remember those. And so this is how we're going to fight in the day. I put on my armor with faith, hope, and love. And what have we learned in Romans? We spent 11 chapters to show that our salvation is by faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and what he has done. I got to put on faith that I stand accepted and loved by God because of the work of Jesus Christ every day. I, got, I begin it with putting that on. I'm a, I am not accepted by how good Ken Murphy is. And I got to preach that every morning. I am accepted this morning because of how good Jesus Christ is. And I, I, I love his work. I love that there's no condemnation. I love that nothing can separate me from his love. The mercies of God in Christ Jesus. I believe those. I live in those daily. It's finished. One time. Justified. You're not being Justified. You're justified when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, put on hope. And he says, the day is almost gone and the morning is coming. So what's the hope? The hope is that the sunrise from on high is coming. And this time, not with an eclipsed glory with a body, but coming and just shining and radiating and glowing in all the holiness and glory and majesty and splendor of Jesus Christ. Like the noonday sun, you're going to have to cover your eyes when he comes. No more sun in the new heavens and the new earth. Just his glory will illuminate it. And so Paul's coming back and saying, now uh, chapter eight, all we did was focus on our eternal security and what's coming. And so how, how do I fight the darkness? I live in hope. And the darkness says, all your hope is right here. And every day it's going to say, here's where you find happiness. Here's where you find satisfaction. And to put on the armor of light, it says, my hope's coming. My hope is soon and I can't lose it. It's for certain. It's guaranteed. And so I'm going to fight all the lies of the darkness with my blessed hope. I've got glory. This train is bound for glory. (laughs) Then put on love. And you remember the whole context. Go back to verse 8 of 13. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the whole law. For this you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet from the tablets. And if there's any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And then he moves right into this present section. And so the love of God constrains us. We live in a world that hates. It just hates. And, and, and we fight the darkness of, of its just self at all cost. And now the children of the light is my life for yours. And so as I put on the armor of light, it's, I, I look at the gospel and my love for Jesus Christ is now ready to be set on in a million different ways for how to manifest that to anybody and everybody. My life for yours. That's what this gospel does. Has it done it in your heart? Or do you just have this little belief about Jesus while you're the most selfish person on the face of the earth who does nothing for nobody? That's not the gospel. The law of Christ. That's how we fight the darkness around us. There's remaining darkness that fills my body called flesh. And it tells me that that the darkness is what will really make me happy. Every one of you still have this within you. So there's no one in here who doesn't still have flesh that has days, times, moments that thinks, ah, this is what will really make me happy. 
And so this flesh is always going to be leading you away from that truth. The world is sleepwalkers. They're zombies. There's darkness within darkness, within and without. And we now come with faith. Our eyes see what God has done in Christ. We know our future. Man, do we know our future. And it causes us to love the way God loves I've been a pastor for over 30 years. And those who get this just make it to the end so well. I've sat on so many deathbeds where they die so beautifully, peacefully, and well because they got this. Faith, hope, and love, not some big long list. That. You can get 20 volume sets and you can read them, the strategies, you can get the secret decoder ring. Faith, hope, and love are the armor of light to fight against the enemy. And I think he fleshes it out a little more if you'll come with me to verse 14. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. So put off the deeds of darkness, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and this is so crucial that we understand this because so much of what is panhandled off as Christianity is I want you to hear this this might be the first time you've ever heard this. Christianity, just put off bad things. Quit doing these bad things. Do these, do these good things. Clean yourself up. Be better. Be your best version of you. Don't do this. Do that. And that's all Christianity is. But the Christianity is Jesus who came into the world and died for our sins and lived the life so we could be righteous. It says, repent from living in darkness and living for yourself and trying to make your own world and believe in me. Repent. Come, believe in Christ. It's why we turn from what we once held dearly as the light shined. And I realized I'm holding a bag of death. I'm holding that which God hates. And I just repent and throw it down. I'm done with my blindness of thinking that's what gives life. <clears throat> and now we see sin and darkness for what it really is. If you just sit here and sin and darkness is beautiful and God's, uh, everything about God is boring, you need to be born again. You need the gospel to break in. That which I once held in my hands and oozed out of my pores is going to damn me. And now I put it off, I cast it down, I changed my clothes. I was just thinking, could you imagine a bride waking up on her wedding day and just say, I wonder if I should take a shower. I took one two days ago. I think I'll go in my grubbies because I want to be comfortable during the ceremony. Put on the most glorious dress there is for a bride. And I want you to hear this. The most glorious thing that you could ever put on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that should bring you to your knees. That's not stand behind Christ. Put him on. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's all of Christianity, and we're going we're gonna to dig on this. What does it mean? The beauty of teaching or preaching is you read over this and you think it's so beautiful, but how do I give a description to it? So the goal of my sermon is that you would better understand what does it mean to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you'll come labor with me, that God would reveal that to us. I know the Holy Spirit's role is to be a floodlight on Jesus so, Holy Spirit, we pray right now that you would just shine on Jesus Christ and that you would give us eyes to behold and see the beauty of what is before us this morning. I pray this in the name of Christ. Amen. A couple observations. <clears throat> it's being compared with the armor of light. And so, verse 12, it says to behave properly, to quit living like when you were in the deeds of darkness. So, I know without a doubt, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is linked to holiness. It's linked to, to holy living, to God. Second, it's contrasted with something. It's contrasted with and make no provision for the flesh. So we are not to make provision for the flesh. We'll explain that in a second. But we're to make provision for Jesus Christ. And so putting on Christ has to be the opposite of indulging your flesh. Instead of just indulging, indulging, whatever my flesh wants, I'm going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ instead of that. So there's a contrast. Paul says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I think they're connected. 
And then what is it consequent to? <clears throat> Paul said, but before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was to later be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ. That's where we're at right now. Lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. We would come to him and believe in him and see him alone as our salvation. It, the law was to lead us there because your own flesh and the law couldn't get you justified, but Christ can. But now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free man. There's neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And you, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. I'm a child of Abraham by this beautiful promise. And so this is your justification, being right with God. So at salvation, we're garmented in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm just going to read 2 Corinthians 5.21. Write down Zechariah 3, 1 through 5 to read later. But it says, He, God, made him Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so in this gospel, you're garmented in Christ's righteousness, and that's the only way you'll ever be accepted. That's the only way you'll ever dwell in his presence. So you have put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're baptized into Christ, and you now wear this garment that makes you acceptable before God. So at salvation, we put on Christ. We're clothed in his merits. And so my question as we move on, have you put on Christ? Have you ever sensed your nakedness before God that all of your morality, all of your religion, all of your good works are a filthy rag before this holy God? Have you ever come where you said uh, naked, Naked, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. I look to thee for dress. I, I look to you to clothe me in an alien righteousness, not my own. I pray that if you need that this morning, and all you're trying to do is clean yourself up, you'll, you'll get nowhere. Jesus is ready to give you the righteousness that he requires. He's ready to, he hung on a cross so that your sins could be forgiven. Please hear that this morning. Romans 13, 14 then put on the Lord Jesus Christ, that has to be different than our justification. So we have put on Christ, and now he's saying, put him on. Put him on. It's kind of like, uh, uh, put the jacket on that you're wearing. Uh, what does this mean? So put on Christ over Christ? Well, Christ is the undergarment who's going to cause you to stand on that last day by his work. But there's something that he wants you to put on today. As a believer in Jesus Christ, he's commanding you to put on Christ. And so this isn't for salvation. This is because you are saved. This is the working out of your salvation, as Paul wrote in Philippians 2. This is in 1 Corinthians 1. By, Jesus, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And so we get all of these things in Christ. Christ is the jackpot. You get to him and every spiritual blessing flows. And, and sanctification, we've been learning, flows from getting to Jesus Christ. And so it, putting him on, as we learned in Romans 7, it's the only way you're ever going to get sanctified. So it's Christ and from middle, uh, beginning to end. What's that St. Patrick quote? I love it. He's beside me, above me. Every, he's just everywhere for the believer. In Christ, we have everything pertaining to life and godliness. And so this is not, there's nothing that I can do for my justification, same for my sanctification. I, I agree with justification. You bring nothing. And now in sanctification, wait till you see how God's going to begin to work out his righteousness in you. And I want you to begin to think high thoughts of sanctification because God gave you a new heart and he gave you a Holy Spirit and he gave you the word of God and he gave you fellowship. And I want you to begin to quit saying, there's no way to overcome this sin. I want you to begin to think higher thoughts of God. He says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sanctify you. And I've given you everything that you need for life and godliness. 
I, I know my cup is always half full, but when I look at the power of God and my sanctification, I think high. I'm optimistic because of God. I want you to begin to see what he's saying. Oh no, it, it's, it's in Christ that I'll be sanctified. It's in Christ that I will fight the good fight of faith. It is in Christ that I will be made holy, that I died to the law, that I might be joined to another in order that I might bear fruit for God. It's in this relationship that you will be sanctified. What did Jesus say? Apart from me, you can do nothing. So it's just, you can't grow in any kind of holiness apart from him. Just hear that. But if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. The, the, the sanctification is abiding in Jesus, putting him on, and he's going to begin to bear the fruit of the Spirit within you. So we don't enter through him and leave him at the door. Thank you, Jesus. I'm saved. We've been joined to him. That's the greatest reality that you have this morning. You are joined to Jesus Christ in a marriage by faith. Smile. <laughs> You've been joined to Jesus Christ in a marriage, a vine and a branch. We get all of our life and vitality and sustenance to bear fruit for God through Jesus Christ. Leave him at the door and there's a reason you're not growing. All fruit bearing is from him and then he gets all the glory. If we don't bear fruit, he says, I'm going to cut you off and throw you in the fire. Why? Because it shows you haven't been joined to the vine. So what this is saying is Christ is the source and the supply of a practical godliness. Romans 13, 14, put them on, living a holy life. It's not just in a mission garment, but it's a working garment. It's a sanctification garment. Put on Christ for pardon and put on Christ for practice. Spurgeon said, who we all love, the rags of sin, the sordid robes of worldliness, what we were in the darkness, are not fit attire for the heavenly morning when he comes back. Those clothes are not the right clothes for the return of Christ. So let us dress for the sun rising. Let us go forth to meet the dawn with the garments of light about us. What is it then to put on the Lord Jesus Christ? You, you look confused. Um, give me a few more minutes. If you're still confused at the end, this is part two of three. If, if you're clear, we're going to chapter 14 next. <laughs> Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. A friend of mine who's a pastor said, it, that means deliberately, consciously consider and appropriate the living Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of conformity to him. Deliberately, consciously consider and appropriate the living Lord Jesus Christ for the purpose of being conformed to him. This is so Christ might be formed in me. Put him on to be changed into his image. And so it all comes together now, the armor of light, faith, hope, love. And what's the greatest of these? Love. And it comes right on the heels of Romans 13, 8 through 10. Edward says heaven is going to be a world of love where we finally can love God and each other perfectly. That's it. And so I want you to get putting on the Lord Jesus Christ is appropriating him in relationship so that we might bear the fruit of love to God and to others. It's a fruit of a relationship. Put them on by faith with the hope that we have and a love. And I think of the world, they love love. They love that. That's what Hallmark is made of. And so I need more definition. So here I want you to see what it is to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's faith in his work alone. And he says this faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we listen to it and we believe it. And I, I keep telling you, I don't know why I got to keep telling my heart and the church of God, you need to believe. <laughs> believe what God's word says. That's what we're all struggling with. Amen. By faith, the just shall live by faith. And so to, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it's faith in who he is and what he's done. And I really believe it. Put that on. And then the hope and the promises where it's all going to be summed up in Jesus Christ. I want you to live that the bridegroom is coming again. I just, I got an eye to him coming back. And then love is, his loveliness is put before you daily. Keep him before you and, and love will flow. 
If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so I just keep Christ before you, and that produces love. And so full circle, this can set you free to love, which is the fulfillment of the whole law. To quit chasing this world for your satisfaction. Maybe to quit living under guilt and shame and hiding from everyone because you're justified and you believe that message. Maybe your past has hurt you so greatly that as you put on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be healed from all that pain and all God's purposes in it and what he's doing in your life. Maybe to, to be certain about your future, to believe, to look at death and taunt it and put a little battery on your shoulder and say, oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? You got nothing on me because Christ Jesus has conquered death. Put on Christ and live in light of his glory, his coming. See the dark, as I put on Christ, I see the darkness for what it is. He's a flashlight. Put him on and it just breaks through all the darkness and you're like, ha, that's foolish. That's sin. That's not gonna get me satisfied. It just shines and you can see. See the darkness for what it is. In his presence, what's the hymn? Temptation loses its power when he's near. You know, it just will break the power. So put on Christ. Get his word in your heart. Believe what it says. Trust his promises. Cling to him. Look at his word and stare at the beauty of Jesus Christ and you will love. Put him on. That is the key to holiness. Brian Chappell, in his book, Holiness by Grace, used an illustration on this. I liked it. He said there was a, this uh, parent had a daughter who brought home a chocolate teddy bear <laughs> from the gift exchange at school for Christmas. The next day, the mother opened the girl's door, and as she opened it, her three-year-old brother was sitting there red-handed, chomping down on the chocolate teddy bear. And the boy backed against the wall, knowing I can't hide my shame and my guilt. And he just began to sob, I'm so sorry. And his mother said, you're still going to have to tell your sister what you did when she gets home. And it's, he said that afternoon seemed like forever for that little three-year-old because he was so worried about how his little sister was going to react. And the sister came home and the boy ran to the door and he just started weeping. He said, Sally, I'm so sorry that I ate your little bear. And he's just weeping. And the sorry sight, just weeping over his guilt. But his sister was very kind, and she took him in her arms and kissed him and said, it's okay, Johnny. I will love you anyways and always. And though he was still crying, the little boy began to giggle. <laughs> I've seen that on some of you, you guys, too. I love it. Tears were still running down his face for his shame, yet at the same time, he was laughing for joy. And from the joy, he hugged his sister with more vigor than he had ever had. So when we face the reality of our sin, that we really are broken to the point of tears, and joy is more deep when you hear the Father say, do not despair, child. I will still love you anyways and always. And that love and gratitude that such a gracious pardon generates, it then becomes the motive for embracing our Lord and his purposes with all of our strength and all of our being. The joy of the Lord is our strength Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. One last thing, sorry. There's something opposed to us putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's our flesh. Flesh starves faith, it quenches hope, and it makes love selfish. So there are things fighting against faith, hope, and love, and it shouldn't surprise you, right? Because every time I pray and say, you just need to believe, it's not by sight, it's by faith. And you're always like, duh. And then I say, it's all about this hope. The second coming, you're like, how did I drift from that? How did I get caught back up in the American dream? Uh, it's about love. Wait a minute. <clears throat> how did I just get going through the motions, doing religious nice things? How do I ever get away from loving Jesus to be motivated to love others? How does that happen? Because all hell is set against these three things. The hell, the devil, your flesh, the world system, everything is against it. Flesh is your enemy. And so he says, don't make any provision for the flesh 
in regards to its lusts. And I want you to catch this. The order is important. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ for your justification. Put him on for your sanctification. And that's where we find power, motivation, desire, and love, and the resolve against sin, then mortification. Please catch that. Make no provision for the flesh. And the errors that I've seen in my own heart and in shepherding is just make no provision. And everybody's running around saying, okay, I'm not going to sin. I'm not going to smoke, dip, or chew, or go with girls who do. And you just, you got all your rules and you just keep doing them. He says, you foolish Galatians that you began by the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? That you only know one command, make no provision for the flesh. You work at it every day. You, you bite down on bullets to, uh, and I'm going to be holy and I work at it and I'm just going to do it. And I've seen a lot of people make no provision for the flesh and be no holier than when they started. And we have great examples in the Bible called the Pharisees. And so I tell you, you can do all those things and not be conformed to the image of Christ. And then the other error is, I just put on the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm happy in Jesus, and I'm just going to make it to glory. I'm just waiting. I'm sitting on my housetop with my pajamas, not with my armor of light on, just sitting there waiting. And the biblical balance is to rest in Christ alone for his finished work daily, Abide in this new relationship that you have with Jesus. Believe him, trust him, and behold him. And fight the good fight of faith. Put off the deeds of darkness. Put on the armor in Christ. Buffet your body. Be a soldier. Put on the armor. Wrestle. Be a farmer. Toil. Paul says, I labor more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. So as we battle sin now, keep an eye to the coming grace of God at the revelation of Jesus Christ because the battle's going to end. And so this is a war. I want you to hear this, believer. We will win. And you're going to lose some battles along the way. Some of you sit here still hurting from them. You're going to win because of God's name and grace and power and work of Jesus Christ. And it can be grueling and hard in seasons when the battle is so fierce and you're battle-worn and the enemy has so many tactics, so many lures and we'll see that we got a traitor on the inside. We have remaining sin that fights us. But we have regeneration, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Word and the power of grace to set you free to begin to live as children of light. One day, and Paul said, it's nearer than when you first believed. The trumpet's going to sound and the Lord's going to descend. Praise the Lord. We will put on Christ perfectly in the second realm. We're going to put him on perfectly and we'll have no more lusts waging war against us for all of eternity. Isn't that good news, tired fighter? I, I, I will not have to fight flesh anymore for all of eternity. It's a blessed hope. Without that, I would quit. What is at the end of this battle is what makes it so sweet. And the end of this battle is where my eyes are fixed on the author and perfecter of faith. It's Christ, my love. And by the grace of God, I'm fighting. So make no provision for the flesh. Greek word for provision is forethought. Paraphrase, don't let any thought in your head that awakens the desire for sin. Stop making plans for it. Don't play with it. Don't linger with it. Don't ple- uh, peek at it. Don't click on it. I heard the example of a kid. He had his hand in the cookie jars. He climbed up uh, to smell them, and his mom said, what did you do? He said, I just wanted to smell the cookies, and my tooth got caught in it. <laughs> I hear that daily. <clears throat> and so I'm just closing with, for anyone that's battle-worn, you're a worn out wife from a husband who never learned how to nurture a woman. Maybe a woman who daydreams about Mr. Perfect. A single who just longing for a wife or a husband. The temptation to 
settle, settle for something else. I met a, a real nice man, and he, he mentioned God one time. I think he's a Christian. Don't settle. Envy, bitterness, wronged, self-pity. Sit around feel sorry for yourself. Anxiety. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, hope, and love, and don't let them lodge. And so he says that, that don't make any provisions. The ace epithumia, and ace is, again, I've told you before, it's like a circle, and you come right into the middle of it. It says, don't make provision to enter in to flesh. These over-desires and wrong desires that bring us into lust. And so really the conclusion is, are you wrapping Christ around you or are you wrapping your lusts around you? Paul's saying either way you're going to be immersed. Which do you want to be immersed in? Christ or your lusts? Are you making provision for the flesh or for Christ? <clears throat> What's your Lord? Jesus or your flesh? That's a hard one, huh? What's your Lord? Put on the words of God that awaken faith, hope, and love. And put on the Lord Jesus Christ. The blessing of being a Christian is second to none that I can have Christ. And I can put him on. And I can know him and love him and be empowered and let all of him flow through me to do things that I could never do apart from Christ. And so I don't know why Christianity threw Christ away. We, 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 we get them at the door, we preach them everywhere, the gospel happens, and then we throw them away. And, and this is telling you, you don't throw Jesus away. Put him on daily. And he's where you're going to find your hope, your joy, and your love. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Let's pray. Father, I pray, let this be so clear, burn through us. This is the time to be awake. This is the time to be putting on Christ and going out, proclaiming him, sharing him, being bright lights that love in a way that nobody in this world loves. We have a transcendent love that comes by being joined to Jesus Christ. God, I pray, I pray that we would grow in this gospel. We would grow in how accepted and loved we are by the finished work of Jesus, that that would fuel the blessing that I could behold Christ and not be condemned. I can now have him as a bridegroom and I can know him and love him and be changed by him and transformed and, and, and picked up and carried when I'm a cast sheep. He can lead me in paths of righteousness. Oh God, thank you for Jesus Christ and let every soul who has been born again this morning put him on. Put him on daily. Put him on above us, beyond us, in us, around us. Just give us Christ. God, give us those sweet eyes to see him for all that he is and let us grow in it. Let us be done with lesser things of strife, jealousy, immoralities, drinking, drunkenness. God, let us be done with the things of darkness and night. And put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Please, I pray, do that in every heart and soul here this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen.